Hey everybody, uh, this is Jed Mashu, and we are back. It's been a while. Uh, it has. We took we took a week off from. Let's blame myself. We, frankly, we could probably blame TNG, but the Naked Truth is finally back in your homes once again. Uh, I am your co-host, Jed Mashu. My co-host is here with me, the Naked Gambler, or as his file is telling me right now, Jed's wife's boyfriend. How you Correct. doing, TNG? I'm angry, Jed. I'm real angry because we took a week off and you you say that you could blame it on me, but the way I see it, it's entirely your fault because when I brought you on, we had a mutual understanding that you'd act as kind of like my babysitter, you know? You'd get me dressed, you'd make sure I showered, you'd make sure that I did the podcast on time and four or five days in a row, I didn't do the podcast. So what's your excuse? I have no excuse, but uh, you're, you're right. I. I, f I fell down on the job because you it failed. is it's like herding cats trying to get you to to do this damn thing. It is a, a constant struggle. <laughs> well, then you shouldn't uh, have signed up for it. I mean, uh, you know, I don't know do job, why I Jen. did. See, here's the reason why I did it, actually, is because I know that you'll never you won't ever have the opportunity to leave me for greener, greener pastures in the podcasting land because I am the only one who can just consistently put up with your fecklessness and the mean comments you send to me just all the time. Just during the day, he'll just send me direct messages on Twitter being like, hey, go fuck yourself. 100%. And uh, I don't think anybody, I don't think anybody else will put up with that. So and I stand uh, by those comments. <laughs> see, I can deal with that. I can deal with the meanness. I can deal with the hurt feelings just for a little job security. That's, that's what I'm in it for. But what you're missing is that a lot of people in the MMA media will put up with it just because they're really attracted to me. Like, attractive people can get away with a lot of things, Jed, as you know, just from dealing with me. Not because you're attractive, <laughs> but you, you know that I get away with a lot because I'm attractive. I'm, I'm a, I think you might be confused about what the people in the MMA media feel. And I'm not sure that it's some sort of uh, attraction so much as it, so much as it is Stockholm syndrome because everybody involved in the sport is a giant dumpster fire uh, oh, yeah. just emotionally, and so they're okay with the abuse. It's uh, it's a, it's a sad state of affairs that this is Very this sad. is what my life has become. I I talk with you once a week if I'm lucky, <laughs> and. Uh, and that, that's it. Um, but this week, we have a lot to talk about. We have so much to talk about since we took a week off. We're going to skip a lot of things. But breaking news, as we record this, uh, my colleague at MMAfighting.com has just reported that Sergio Pettis versus Henry Cejudo, I believe that was the main card opener for UFC 211 this weekend, uh, that has been canceled because Cejudo sustained a hand injury that is just coming to light now. Uh TNG, what, give me give me your uh, immediate thoughts on it. What are you what are you feeling? What do you think? Go wax poetic. Okay, well, my immediate thought is that you said, as reported by your colleague at MMAfighting.com, which I happen to know is Ariel Helwani, and we we agreed that we never mentioned Ariel Helwani even indirectly on the show again after Stategate. His we, recent comments, the recent uh, controversy, the bombshell that he dropped on Twitter. It's true. I. Uh, We'll jump ahead a little bit, and I, I do have to say that it, it breaks my heart, but uh, at, at this moment in time, Ariel Helwani is, is about to be, or is, has been named an enemy of the show Correct. because because of just an absolutely horrendous tweet uh, where, let me see if I have it uh, immediately pull, pull upable. If not, it was just, it was awful, guys. He, uh, he said, for the record, I only eat my steaks well done. I like them extra crispy. Uh, I'm I'm hoping that uh, we can get Ariel to come on the show at some point and refute this and say he was hacked, that John Jones got a hold of his Twitter account or or something. That does but, sound like something John Jones would do. To be fair, it's and then John would say that he he in turn was hacked while hacking Ariel. So I'm hoping that that's the case that we can all have a, a happy ending here because. Uh, as it stands right now, Ariel Hawani, enemy of the show, because that is just an abomination uh, that that will not stand. I will not stand for anybody eating crispy steaks. I'm just not for it. Yeah, it's the culinary equivalent of a war crime. It, it's quite serious. And honestly, 
if it were up to me, it would be punishable by an international tribunal. I mean, just crispy steak with, with ketchup? That's not like that's not what you're trying to be about? You're not about that life? I'll kick you off this podcast right now, Jed. <laughs> I'll turn this car around. <laughs> but uh, um, on uh, Cejudo versus Pettis, uh, I recently found out, and when I say recently, I mean the last 20 minutes, that there's a Sergio Pettis, and he's the one who was supposed to be fighting Cejudo. And it wasn't Anthony Pettis. And now I'm just is. confused. He, also, uh, I they just look found very that, similar. They both yes. have soul patches, as far as I'm aware, um, which is a bold fashion statement in the year of 2017. Uh, but, um, and one could argue that Sergio will end up being a better fighter than Anthony Pettis, despite the fact that there was a, a brief window when Anthony Pettis was viewed as, as some type of insurmountable god of the lightweight division. Yeah, because he was pulling off, like, uber-dynamic things all the time, and nobody had any real counters to it. Nobody had any idea how to stop him from doing that. It's like with JDS. Like, JDS was a god until people figured out his really big weaknesses that could be exploited consistently fight to fight for the same result for years. Years and years and years. I mean, I still think Anthony Pettis is the best lightweight on Earth. He's just, uh, just had some bad luck, that's all, really. And the best featherweight on Earth. <laughs> yeah i'm not sure about that <laughs> um but uh what are your thoughts on on you know the loss of the fight how it happened i'll be i'll be honest i'll bury the lead here something seems a little off to me uh that he sustained a hand injury just like three days before the car like you know usually you're not doing any big workouts at this point now your workouts are all cardio based just kind of staying loose and fresh so I, you know, we were talking about it a little bit before we went on air. I think, I think it might be time for a real, a real capital J journalist to get out there and ask the tough questions. Like, was he masturbating too aggressively, and is that what broke his hand? Yeah, because it's a surprisingly common thing. Like uh, we've seen lots of fighters in the past pull out of events due to masturbating furiously. It happened with Aldo. Um, it happened with uh, multiple Ordier. times with Aldo. <laughs> yeah, multiple times Aldo's with Aldo. As as Conor McGregor astutely noted, Jose Aldo is a consistent pullout merchant. So <laughs> it's a it's a big issue, I think, and I think it's all rooted in the fighter culture of you know not having sex before fights, and you know sometimes a guy's just got to jerk off. Can and, you blame and, Henry Cejudo? I can't, and you know Aren't I know the all? feeling. <laughs> Aren't we all Olympic gold medalists who break our hands masturbating before a fight that could theoretically get him back into title contention? Yeah, I roll that guy. I roll my eyes when people say that Henry Cejudo is an Olympic gold medalist because he is. But at the same time, I mean, I think maybe it was Mike Reardon that said it on Twitter a long time ago. But I read someone who's really involved in wrestling say that Cejudo was completely unremarkable right up until the moment that he won an Olympic gold medal. Like he just got out of bed and won a gold medal, and he was like, "Hey, I'm an Olympic gold medalist now." But before that, there was never anything outstanding about his uh wrestling career yeah as far as i'm aware he was not uh any exact like that's pretty well it's, that pretty well says it all that he wasn't some guy that was pers that was a prospect to really dominate and he just kind of had a really good week <laughs> like yeah, so good for really him good like week. that's that's awesome like he uh i think he only wrestled in one world championship other than that uh, I, I mean I guess the Olympic Games aren't technically a world championship um, but yeah like he just he just showed up one day and 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 it worked out super well for him and you know I'm all about that life I'm never gonna knock somebody who just uh, who Michael Bisping's it you know yeah. underachieves gets just gets there on the right day the right time and then milks it for all his worth so uh, I I'm support I support Henry Cejudo gold medalist and I support Henry Cejudo aggressive masturbator too. A hundred percent. It's hard not to. It's hard not to <laughs> empathize with this position, whatever position he was doing it in. It had to be something really <laughs> tricky for to get to get a severe hand injury like that. Um, maybe we can get him on the show. Maybe he will become a friend of the show and tell us about about his masturbatory ways. Um, yeah. Um. My expert opinion is that he was probably relying a little bit too heavily on the over-under grip, and, uh, you know, it happens. It happens. You strain the wrist, and, I mean, what can you do? That's why you got to go Western. You gotta, it's important to do, use, use the Western grip. Keeps things 
uh, easy, especially when you're right before a big a big event. You, you know, you just want to work it out. You don't want to overexert yourself. Yeah, right before a big big event, like a huge one, one that's just going to go everywhere. <laughs> exactly, like fighting Sergio Pettis uh, on that sure, fight. That's I am. I, I did. <laughs> Uh, I am a little bit sad to see that fight go because I was actually genuinely sort of interested in the fight um, insofar as one can be interested in the flyweight division that uh, that seemed like a, a decent thing but uh, I'll leave it to you we've got we've got several talking points to get to today uh, the biggest one obviously we're going to do some some discussion of, of UFC 211 the fight card coming up uh, would you like to jump into that now or do you want to hit our other topics and then end on 211? I mean, structuring the show is your job, Jed. I just show up and talk, and I mean, you do the rest, so uh, you direct us. Okay, well, uh, let's do let's do the other topics, because 211 might end up just spiraling out of control, as we have been known to do. Uh, a lot of things happened the last week, but let's start with uh, today. You got into a bit of a Twitter discussion about Yoani on Jacek. Uh, sidebar, uh, just because I just thought of it as I said her name. Uh, I don't know if any of you listen to uh, the podcast, who listened to this, listen to the Pardon My Take podcast, which is usually a fairly delightful podcast. Uh, they were advertising for 211, and these are guys who clearly don't watch fighting at all. And within the span of 30 seconds, they had to pronounce uh, Ioana Jacek, Karolina Kovalkiewicz, and Jessica Andraj. Oh, and it was... It made me so happy to listen to them be like, Ioana, you're... Uh, who just beat Carolina Kovbad. It was it was an incredible ad read. It made me really happy. So I would suggest any of you find that out if you seek that out to listen to it because it made my day. But uh, TNG, tell tell the people what you were discussing about Yoani on Jacek. You want a champion, uh, and then we can go from there. Okay, so. At first, we were just kind of discussing uh, the fight, and what I noticed, I was discussing it with Kaposa, Grabaka Hitman, who I'm sure most of our listeners will know, and um, the big theme around the fight and the big narrative is that, yeah, Andrade is going to win early, and she's probably going to hurt um, Ian Jacek, who's looked more and more vulnerable with each and every passing fight. I mean, she looked... The fact that she got rocked by Kovalkiewicz, I mean, it couldn't it could mean nothing, but at the same time... Kovalkiewicz is far from a power puncher, and there's a lot to worry about with uh, Jan Jacek's style, because Andrade is another fighter who's very similar to Gedalia in that she'll have a big speed advantage and a big power punching advantage, and she'll probably be able to use that speed advantage in the same way that Gedalia did to land shots early, and when Gedalia landed shots early, she was able to consistently hurt Jan Jacek. And the question becomes, even if we give uh, Yuana Champion the benefit of the doubt and say that she's going to beat um, Andraj on Saturday. How many more fights like this can she possibly take? It's the old Robbie Lawler conundrum. Like, we assume that she's going to win because she's more technical, but we also assume that she's going to take damage and probably a significant amount of damage. So at what point down the line does it become a case of, well, the significant amount of damage is just too much and now the next power puncher she fights, we're going to pick that person against her? Because a lot of people picked Woodley to beat Lawler just because, you know, all those wars, all those ridiculous wars. And the women's strawweight division isn't quite like the welterweight division. It doesn't have that level of power punching, obviously, but at the same time, it shots are shots. Arguably the best athlete in MMA competing in it. Yeah, but I mean, Gedalia and Andraj are both really freaky physical athletes, especially compared to Jan Jacek, who Jan Jacek has what I describe as decent durability maybe good durability but not exceptional outstanding durability like she can be hurt she can definitely be hurt and she can be finished and and Traz is just faster just like Gedalia was she's significantly faster and that's something that hindered uh Jan Cechek against Gedalia and I think it's something that's going to hinder her here and if we're assuming that she's going to take punishment who's the next power puncher she's going to fight Nami Yunus are we going to pick Nami Yunus over her or are we going to assume that, like, even though Nami Yunus is another fighter who's very fast and hits hard, maybe she'll take some punishment early, but her technical edges will win out in the end? I, uh, I'm i excited about the Nami Yunus fighting either of them. I do think Yun Jacek probably beats Nami Yunus. I'll, I'll be honest, until you told me about, like, this Twitter conversation you had, I hadn't really considered the idea of Yun Jacek in, like, the Robbie Lawler 
sort of sphere just because I, I don't know, to me, there's a enormous gulf of difference between young Jacek getting dropped by Kovalkiewicz and still like mostly being okay. And then coming back in the fifth round and being fine versus Robbie Lawler going hammer and tongs with Roy McDonald with Johnny Hendricks twice. And then just almost dying against Carlos Condon. <laughs> like, I think, yeah. I think these are worlds apart as far as like a concern over forthgoing, like ongoing uh, durability issues. I'll also be honest, I've yet to do my uh, study for this fight. I'm, I work my way from the bottom of the card up. So if you want to talk in fucking depth about uh, Joachim Christensen versus uh, whoever the and like uh, Godzilla Medic Antigulov, I don't. I can't Antigulov remember. is supposed to be pretty good, right? Uh, I think he's gonna win, but it. I think the fight's a little closer. But also, I think people wildly underestimate uh, that Joachim uh, Joachim Christensen. His initials are JC, same initials as Jesus Christ. Pretty important to remember Jesus Christ. Really good at a lot of things. Um, so you Not know, so just much saying. Fighting, though. I mean, he's pretty good at turning the other cheek, which is basically just like taking taking a beating and still being in there. So yeah, he, real tough he had a guy. Good chin. We'll give him that. He had a really good chin. Look, good chin is that's like half the battle in MMA. So yeah. I'm not I'm not saying that Joachim Christensen is in fact the second coming of Jesus Christ. I'm just saying maybe we should start looking just just look at the signs, people. Just just look at the signs. Be aware that it's keep an open it's in mind. play. Exactly, it's in play. Um, but well, yeah, so of, I'm, uh, chins like that's one of my concerns with Yanjie is that like I said, she has good durability but not exceptional durability. She can clearly be hurt. But she gives fighters a lot of time. Like with Penny, she finished her, and like she finished a few people. But they like Esparza and Penny were women that she was really beating the hell out of consistently, who offered no offense whatsoever. Those were about as attractive as stoppages get. And in terms of just traditional stopping power, like she doesn't really have any tools that immediately finish fights. She rarely just kind of like there was the Rosie Sexton K was the only one I can think of. Where Yen Jacek just kind of flatlines someone. Oh, yeah, but, she she thumps you up slowly. Yeah, and she gives people plenty of time and plenty of opportunities. But like the entire thing just makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable because I get a kind of vibe from her that she's carrying a lot more wear than you might assume for a 29 year old woman. Because I mean, she has a really long history in Muay Thai. I was going to say and, she had a deep career in Muay Thai, so that's yeah. very likely true. And on top of that, the lower down you go in weight, uh, fighters tend to peak earlier, as I'm sure you've noticed. Like Lightweights peak a lot earlier than heavyweights, for example, or decline a lot earlier. And I'd assume that maybe the same is true of strawweights, where the, like you lose your athletic edge so quickly. And I kind of get a post-surgery GSP vibe from uh, Ioana Champion, like in the way that she moves and in the way that she fights. As in, she might be losing a step, but it might be happening so subtly that it'll only really be obvious with the benefit of hindsight. Ooh, I've never considered that. Uh, I don't really have any... I, I'm just going to move on from that and let that sort of hang while I digest it and get back to the thing that I was uh, saying, which was really that like my concerns with this fight have never really been like, oh, Jessica Andrade is just going to like flatliner or hit her really hard and like this is the fight where joanna uh starts to get caught up to in that it is much more uh what you were talking about the speed like i do think andrage despite the fact that andrage has dropped you know dropped down from 135 i think she's very clearly the faster fighter i think she puts a little more volume on although i do uh think that she has less defense but it's just i think that uh my concern because i'll be like i'm a joanna joanna violence mark like if I could, she's absolutely, she's the best friend of the pod. I love her like my sister or whatever, um, because she's made me really happy just watching her beat the shit out of people and being an absolute boss while she does it. But Jessica Andrade, like, I think Jessica Andrade can very likely put a real pressuring game onto Joanna and Jacek. And if Jacek wants to like sit in the pocket and exchange, that seems like that's, like I think I think Yanjechik has to 
move a lot more, circle out, play Matador a lot more than she is comfortable doing and then that she naturally does. And so before I watch tape and review all this, I am actually leaning a little towards Andrade as the pick here, but I hope I'm wrong once I review everything. <laughs> uh, I picked Yan Jacek, but I think it's pretty close. Well, I mean, I should quantify that. I think it's close in a two to one kind of way like maybe in check wins 65 percent of the time to andrage's 35 percent i think that she has a huge technical advantage in check does and the things that troubled her about gedalia andrage can do some of them better but others she can't do as well like andrage punches in combination better than gedalia does she's a more dangerous uh flurrier once she gets you against the fence but her footwork isn't as tight as gedalia's gedalia's always had tighter footwork Gedalia's footwork is very underrated. It's actually pretty damn good by any standards. I don't have any qualm with anything you just said there. I think that's fine. Um, I'm not going to argue those points, but here's the point we will argue. Uh, actually, no, because we're, we're not supposed to be talking about 211. We've, we've gotten off track. God damn it. I can't keep you in bounds at all, you asshole. Um, so, Yoanny and Jacek, I don't think she's getting Robbie Lawler um, in the in the respect that Robbie Lawler like just got had his doors blown off uh, because like I said I do think there's a world of difference between 50 minutes with Johnny Hendricks and an absolute absurd war with Roy McDonald uh, than Joanna getting clipped a couple times by Gedalia and then beating the shit out of her for 15 minutes and you know Kovalkiewicz yeah. landing one good flurry over the course of 25 minutes um, but moving on to other things before we get into the big talk, which is two eleven. Uh, one, I'm we're gonna jump ahead again. Friend of the show, I'm gonna name a friend of the show right now. That friend of the show is Justin Gaethje. Uh, he is the hot shit dude, uh, hot shit World Series of Fighting lightweight champion who has just been signed to the UFC last week or early this week. I don't recall which. Um. And so he's making his way over, and I don't know if you listened to the MMA Hour interview with him, TNG, but holy shit, this guy is a hero. No, I haven't heard it, but uh, I have been on the Gaethje bandwagon for a long time. I wrote a piece a few months back calling him the most exciting fighter and the most exciting spectacle in all of MMA, and I can't miss true. attraction. Uh, he is ridiculous. He won't be fighting very long. Don't get that into your head because the way he fights is not conducive to a lengthy career. But while he's here, enjoy every single second of Justin Gaethje that you can get. But uh, tell me about this interview. Go on. Okay, so he's got a he's got a host of quotes from it. But the one I'll say right now because it fits into expertly what you just said. Uh, so he he spoke with Ariel for a while, and uh, he goes, uh, I'm, "I'm looking up the quote right now because it's so perfect. I want to." get it exactly right um you know was asked about like oh are you going to be the champion you're coming over you were the champion of wsof everybody loves you what is uh and i quote i'm not promising anything i'm not promising success i'm not promising that i promise you that i will get knocked out here in the next 10 fights because it's a game of centimeters and fractions of seconds come on i've watched every single one of my fights in slow motion and i live i beat you to the time i beat you to the punch i'm in your face and you can't breathe <laughs> So he's just, he just said what you said, like, I'm awesome, I'm all action, and that's going to catch up with me real quick, and somewhere in the next 10 fights, I'm getting slept. What a fucking hero. I, the whole, the the rest of the interview had, like, some other good stuff. The the best part about it, to me, was, um, and I guess the biggest headline grab that came from it was Gaethje saying, uh, who he wants for his debu uh, debut. Uh, he wants the scariest dude, the guy who can embarrass him the most. Like, he just wants to get in there and fucking throw down. Justin, yeah. Justin Gaethje is just, he's a gym and he is my friend of the show, absolutely. Yeah, I can agree with that. The thing about Gaethje is that he's a wild man, but there might not be any other wild men competing the way he does that also carry the same understanding of the costs of fighting like that. Because he really understands and he just does anyway. He's a smart guy. Like, if you listen to his interviews, he's obviously very intelligent. But, I mean, he has a great mind for the sport. And the fact that he understands exactly the kind of strain that he's putting on himself fighting this way and the, the limitations he's putting on his career, and he still does it, I mean, he's balls out, man. That guy doesn't give a fuck. Not a single solitary fuck. He doesn't. And, I like, I'll, I'll be honest to pull the curtain back a little bit here. 
I enjoy the fact that I do think he is extremely aware of everything. Like he doesn't, he's, he's made the, the math, the mathematic decision in his head. Like, this is how I do. This is how I live. I know that this is likely detrimental to my health and I'm willing to sacrifice that in exchange for this exact thing. And I don't think that a lot of, I think there are a lot of fighters that don't particularly make that, have that mental calculus added up. Uh, and so it does, you know, it makes me feel a little better to be like, hey, because sometimes I'll admit, sometimes I feel a little, feel a lot shitty that like the thing I spend a majority of my time doing is watching other people hurt other people, likely with long term consequences. But when Justin Gaethje does it, I'm like, oh, he knows. He knows and it's cool. Like Chris Lytle was the same way. Chris Lytle, once he started hunting bonuses, basically it was just like, yeah, I know that this is not super great for my health, but. I've a, I've made a lot of money doing it. My kids go to college. This is all like totally totally worth the exchange. So yeah. Justin Gaethje warms my heart that he is at least aware of how dangerous what he is doing is, and then it absolves me of all my guilt. I can just wipe my hand of feeling any type of shame about it because I don't give a shit. He can go out and do glorious violence for my self satisfaction. Just on what you were saying about that and here in Guild, um, I think MMA has actively made me a worse person because there are a lot of times where my my view of MMA right now when I watch it is almost like a Mark who watches WWE. Like, I want to think of the fighters as characters and I want to think of them as their their entertainment personas because I don't want to think of them as people because thinking them of them as people is hard. So when Jake Ellenberger fights Mike Perry, I don't want to think of the fact, and I didn't think of the fact, that Jake Ellenberger seems like a really nice guy and Mike Perry seems like a huge scumbag. What I thought of was that Mike Perry is entertaining as fuck in the octagon and Jake Ellenberger's had lots of bad fights and so I was rooting for him to get knocked out even though that makes no sense on a, a human level. Like, if I thought of these fighters as human beings actively, second to second, like, and I thought about their personal lives, it would really impair my enjoyment of the sport to some degree, because it's so much easier to just disconnect yourself from certain facets of it, and to just kind of pretend it's not there almost. I mean, in the back of your head, you always know that the brain trauma is there, the CT is there, fighters are being underpaid, everybody's getting fucked, it's a terrible dumpster fire, but... That's just kind of how I cope as a consumer. Maybe it's just me, but I I don't view fighters rationally most of the time. Most of the time when I'm watching a fight, I'm engaged in the storylines almost like it's WWE. Like, I, I rooted for John Jones over Daniel Cormier the second time. Or the, the both times. I know it didn't go through the second time, but I rooted for him both times. And the reason is just being because John Jones is a hilarious scumbag. I find his scumbag persona endearing because it's entertaining. But in a real world context, he's... <laughs> I, I don't want to be too harsh on John Jones. I was, I was going to say some not too nice things about him. But uh, <laughs> friend of the show, John Jones, he's a good kid. He's a good kid. <laughs> he's just a misunderstood kid. He's just he's figuring yes. it out. He, he's, he's definitely not a sociopath that's for sure not even a little bit <laughs> yeah and and daniel cormier like nobody can say that daniel cormier seems like an asshole he seems like that he's just the daddest guy in in mma he's so dad he's, he's so, so dad. fucking dad and it's so lovable he's a great guy i want all the success in the world for daniel cormier but i still rooted for john jones and john jones <laughs> is a piece of shit I want all the success in the world for Daniel Cormier unless he's fighting John Jones, is what you just said. So you don't want all the success. You, you want a limited amount of success I, for him. I, I even rooted for Rumble over Cormier, and I fucking hate Rumble. I really, really dislike Rumble. Hate is a strong word, like, but I I don't like Rumble at all. He just, uh, he weirds me out. When I listen to Rumble talk, I, I sense something that I've sensed in people that I, I've really disliked in the past. Yeah, a certain quality about him that really bothers me. But I rooted for him because his his entertainment persona of this big, goofy behemoth who can kill you, but if he doesn't kill you, he just melts and lets you kill him. I mean, I really like that. I really, I find that entertaining. And so I wanted big him to win against glass cannons, are you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when Cormier won, I was happy on a human level. Like, deep down somewhere, I thought that was great because I really like Cormier, but... The Mark side of me, I wanted Rumble to win that fight. 
And don't, I don't know how to explain that. There's a lot of dissonance there, to be honest. Don't you lie. You were happy as soon as Daniel Cormier got on the mic and was like, <laughs> just like Jimmy Sit Manuel, down, young man. I, I like you, but you beat Corey Anderson. Like, I like Corey, but come on, man. That's not because that was my favorite thing that's happened this year. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> was an incredible line. Um, look, man, I, I feel you. It's. I didn't ever have these struggles. I'm going to be honest. Until I became like a media member, I'd never had these struggles. It was just like, oh, whatever. I just watched people fight and I turned it on and off and that was it. And now that I'm much more involved in it, I'm like, dude, this is... So really, they get paid not very much to put their lives in a lot of danger. And so I'm, I'm with you all on the dissidents. Uh, but it's like we've said it a hundred times before. Um it's it's the de facto motto of the show. If you watch MMA, you're a piece of shit. And yeah. uh, and if you listen to this podcast, then you're a real piece of shit because that yeah, means you watch MMA worst, to a degree. Worst. Yeah. So like, and just think about that, guys. If you're listening to this podcast, we are both calling you pieces of shit. Like that's make no mistake about it. But think of how big a piece of shit we have to be to create this podcast. Exactly. It's, we're the biggest turds of them all. So. It's a, it's a hard thing, but speaking of turds, uh, let's move on to our next topic. Uh, we've discussed it a, a decent amount of time in general, but we're going to circle back around to it. The middleweight division is lorded <laughs> over. <laughs> like the, That's what we call a good segue. The middleweight division is lorded over by, a, by another piece of shit, uh, who is the spiritual uh, mascot. The Friend of the show, spiritual leader of the show, Michael Bisping is your middleweight champion. And news came out within the last week and a half or whatever. Uh, a lot of things happened. Namely, George St. Pierre came out and said, hey, Bisping, I just cleared my schedule for the summer. Defi despite the fact that we agreed that we announced our fight like two months ago or whatever the fuck it was. Now I've cleared my schedule to start training. I'll be ready anytime from October onward you pick the date. Uh, not a lot of people excited about it. It means that the middleweight title will have at the earliest be contested or will have not been defended for over a year, despite the champion being in perfect health, um, and having a backlog of contenders. And this week, Luke Rockhold went on, uh, enemy of the show, Errol Helwani's podcast, uh, the MMA hour, where he tried to, j uh, gin up, uh, mutiny of the middleweight division, uh, telling all the other top contenders they should refuse to fight until an interim belt is created because Bisping's full of shit. So uh, let's let's dive into the wonderful world of 185 pounds. TNG, what are your thoughts on uh, George St. Pierre saying he's not going to fight until after October uh, for the belt? Um, I'm in favor of pretty much any loophole that Michael Bisping can use to artificially prolong his title reign. I think it's fantastic. I think that uh, facing like Dan Henderson, GSP, as I've said, I think the perfect next opponent is someone like Vitor Belfort. Just never fight Whitaker, never fight Romero, because there's no reason to. There's really no reason to. Who wants to see that? Who wants to see Michael Bisping get brutally knocked out? I don't want to see that. I assume uh, none of our listeners want to see that. Really, I just want to see him fight bums. Not that GSP is a bum, but relatively he's a bum. On the he relative, fought in like five down, years. Yeah. Pretty much. Oh, let's just say it. He's a bum. All right, let's just throw it out there. GSP's a bum, folks. Always was, always will be. But uh, I want to see him fight more bums, like uh, Vitor Henderson again. I think it's fantastic. I really do. I, uh, I've got dissonance here because there's a part of me that just loves the chaotic... That, that that's the real appeal to the sport is just the absolute chaos and Michael Bisping is basically chaos incarnate at this point and so it's just like there's a part of me that really digs Michael Bisping's reign at the same time like we've basically we basically watched Jacare Souza establish that he never he's never going to fight for a title now because he was forced to hang around too long Yo Romero's 40 years old he you know, if he has to take another fight, he might not ever contest for a title. So there is a little part of me, the little part that, you know, likes Daniel Cormier, the little part of me that's a good human being that's not an utter piece of shit that just hates the shit out of this because, like, look, I'll be honest. I think Michael Bisping, I think there are, like, 12 people 
that weigh less than 186 pounds that beat Michael Bisping in a fight. I tweeted this like a week ago and I stand like I got a lot of heat by people. Oh, you're a hater. Like, I don't think so. So I'm going to go down this list of people and you tell me if you agree or disagree with the various people I say that would beat Michael Bisping that can make the middleweight limit. Sure. Uh, all right. So in the middleweight division, Bisping's your champion. I'm just going to go down the re- UFC rankings in order. Yoel Romero, totally think he beats Michael Bisping. Yes. Luke Rockhold. Uh, I have to say yes, really. I kind of have to okay. say yes. <laughs> you thought about it a lot more than I thought you would, honestly. Um, yeah, because like the way Bisping beat him, when he beat him, he just gamed him, man. Like, there was nothing fluky about that. He literally just gamed Luke Rockhold. He knew what Luke Rockhold was going to do, and he countered it. And Luke Rockhold got knocked out. And I give a lot of credence to that performance. A lot more than the average fan. A lot of fans think of it as just like a pure fluke, but I can't see it that way. Because it just didn't play out that think, way. I don't know that it's... A, I don't think that it's a fluke, per se, but I think if they rematch, Rockhold wins 90 times out of 100. Uh I think you is. mean if they rematch with Rockhold having knowledge of their second fight, right? Because if you just mean they rematch, like, but they're in the same form as they were on that night, yes. Bisping wins way, way, way more often yeah. than not. No, like if they, I, I, when I say rematch, I mean if they trilogy fight. Okay. Yeah, like obviously, yeah, they've. I think, I think Rockhold wins that fight nine times out of ten. Um, uh, Robert Whitaker clearly. We're both going to pick Bobby Knuckles there, right? Of course. Uh, I think Musasi beats Bisping up. I think he actually kicks the shit out of Michael Bisping. Quite possible. I'd probably favor Musasi. I still think Jacare beats beats Bisping, though now I am actually a little more concerned that I'm incorrect in that decision. I'd take Bisping. I'm not willing to do it. I'm still picking Jacare over him. Uh, after that last performance against Whitaker, I think there's it's a... Like, before the Whitaker fight, I think Jacare would have been a prohibitive favorite there. I think now it's much more uh, even keel fight. But at the same time, I also, like, Bisping's getting old, too, and I think we're going to start to see a real decline from him in that respect. Uh, I'd take Weidman over him. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't... I would pick Bisping over Anderson Silva with the caveat that Anderson could absolutely still beat Bisping. (laughs) Yeah. I'd agree with that, Uh, too. Uh... Derek Brunson, I think I would pick Bisping, but with the yeah. same caveat that Brunson could absolutely beat Bisping. I'd agree with that. I'd pick Bisping as well. Uh, I think Chris Goff Jocko feeds Bisping his ass. Sure. Uh, I think Bisping handily beats Vitor Belfort, although I do think there's a small window that Belfort like spinning kicks his head off. I think there's an actually decent-sized window. Like, you don't have to be very athletic or dynamic to catch Bisping with something big and dynamic. I mean, Dan Henderson's been throwing the same right hand for 150 years, and he caught Bisping with it in two consecutive rounds. He did, but, I mean, my stance on that is really just, like, if if Vitor doesn't land it in the first three minutes, then Vitor's just going to give up, because that's that's what Vitor does. So, uh so look, then you're adding even one more. Like, then good, it's swapped. I pick Jacare, you pick Bisping, so we're swapped. So we're still at what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total people that we would pick over Bisping just in the middleweight division. I would pick Bisping to beat Talos Leites. I would pick Bisping to beat Uriah Hall, though Uriah Hall could just do some crazy athletic shit and kill him. Uh, and I pick him to beat the rest of the middleweight top ten. So I've got eight middleweights right now that I think Michael Bisping loses to. Um, I think it's very stylistically based. Some of them, like Romero, I don't think are particularly far-fetched that Bisping could win. But then someone like Musasi, I don't know. It's kind of difficult for me to envision a scenario in which Bisping beats Musasi. Maybe he could do it on volume. But durability and punching okay. power alone, durability and punching power alone should mean that Musasi fat lines him. And just to go back to something you were saying earlier, you talked about dissonance as far as the middleweight division goes because of Romero's impending retirement, uh, retirement the next few years. Me, I honestly don't have any dissonance at all because there are only three good middleweights. There's Romero, Bobby Knuckles, and Musasi. Three good middleweights. And they can just fight amongst themselves anyway. 
What do we need the belt for? I really don't care. Why There's do you not like Luke Rockhold? I mean, <laughs> I, okay, I know you dislike him personally. I understand that. Why do you not like him as a fighter? Well, he lost to Michael Bisping. You literally can't <laughs> be good with Michael Bisping. Touche. Touche. The thing is... Excuse me, Christoph Jocko is a good middleweight. I'm, I'm big on the Jocko train, man. Who? Uh, he's fighting this weekend. I know it's it's weird, but he is. He's awesome. He's he's like Michael Bisping, only not old and shitty. That sounds he's terrible. A, he's a That's... high volume kickboxer without power, who's also like sneaky good at taking people down and controlling them. That sounds much more boring than Michael Bisping. Michael Bisping being old and bad is kind of part of his appeal as champion. I mean, yeah, he is definitely a way more boring fighter than Bisping in all. He doesn't like talk. His name is has fifty consonants in a row. He's way more boring than Bisping. But I also think he would just—I won't say dust up Bisping, but I think he would convincingly outpoint him over five rounds. Uh, I think I'd take Bisping over Jocko at this point. I mean, <laughs> you're just a hater. Yeah, I am kind of a hater. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. But I mean, like, there's three good middleweights, literally three. There's Bobby Knuckles, Romero, and what's his face, Musasi. And then, other than that, what, like the belt. You know, when Vitor was calling for the Legends division and just having old brain damaged men fighting each other over and over He's again, just calling on the for the middleweight division. Exactly. He was calling for the 2017 middleweight division, and now he has it. Now he can come out of retirement. It can be <laughs> like Anderson Silva can get a title shot next. Fuck it. Don't give any of the good fighters title shots because they don't need them. It's Bobby Knuckles, Romero, and Musasi. Just have those three fight it out in a, a three-way match and find out who's the better man. Love it. <laughs> three uh, men enter, one man leaves. Okay. Well, uh, I do. I do want to touch on this for a second. Welterweights who we who we think could beat Michael Bisping. Oh yeah, Wonder you know, Boy, baby. George St. Pierre is is coming up to fight him. He's frankly a welterweight. Uh, I'm probably, yeah, I'm gonna pick Bisping in the fight. Um, but as He's far as like actual welterweights, George St. Pierre up. Like Tyron Woodley just beats the shit out of Michael Bisping, right? Like he eventually lands a big right hand, like fucking Dan Henderson did. Only he can actually finish the job. Well. Compared to Woodley, Dan Henderson is just a punching bag with a brick stuck to the right side of it that's just slowly spinning around in place. That's pretty much the best way to describe Dan Henderson's style. Woodley, I don't know. There are more dynamic guys than Dan Henderson who haven't been able to find as much success uh, against Bisping as Henderson did in that second fight. Like, even CB Dalloway is more dynamic than Dan Henderson, and he only knocked Bisping down once. So... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know what to make of that fight. But judging purely on that, you'd have to think that Woodley finishes him within the first 15 nanoseconds. Yeah, I I would comfortably pick Woodley. I would comfortably pick Wonder Boy to out kickbox Michael Bisping. Uh Wonder Boy's Robbie too. Lawler. Robbie Lawler. Well, I mean Wonder Boy is the last victory over Robert Whitaker, if I'm not mistaken. Uh correct. Uh and Knocked him out. He, and here's, we were talking about him earlier, Robbie Lawler, you know, I know that Robbie's coming back, he's fighting Donald Cerrone, hell of a fucking fight, um, and, but the thing, my thing with Robbie is, I don't, do we want to see him fight T-Wood, T-Wood again? Like, it wouldn't be that no. hard for him to work his way back to a welterweight title shot, but is that the thing? No. Like, maybe, he's already competed at middleweight for a long time, middleweight's a pretty open division, if he just goes up there, like, I like, as assuming he's not completely shot, and I think his you know, extended time off to recover might help with that. I think Robbie Lawler would hand Bisping his ass. You know what? I disagree. Oh! I'm stunned. Uh, Why? Consistency and uh, Bisping is more vulnerable from the right side than the left. That was my immediate thought when you said Robbie Lawler. Like, Bisping generally doesn't get caught too much with, like, left hooks and stuff, which is Lawler's money bunch. Like, he's most... He he tends to get hurt by orthodox fighters more than people from Southpaw. Like, even Vitor, like, when Vitor caught him, I'm pretty sure he caught him from the, the right side with a spinning wheel kick. Like, it wasn't... Uh... As I'm replaying it in my head, I think that's right. 
I can't. I won't say it's. I'm 100 percent certain on that. But yeah. Either way, we'll just assume it's right because I said it, and uh, things I say are generally you're, right. And you're a real fucking genius. Is that a real fucking genius? Yet I'm glad you brought that up. That's the new tagline of the show: real fucking geniuses doing real fucking genius things for 90 <laughs> minutes a week for your pleasure. It's true. Um, well, damn. I I thought that Robbie Lawler was gonna be much more i just like i haven't i didn't break masvidal, it down to X. oh Mas, yeah that's masvidal cool. wants to fight bisping he literally said that he wants to fight bisping let me you call him a salty coward right uh that sounds right that. i didn't um but yeah like that's that's my take like i have this belief in general that fight if you're an elite fighter fighting up a weight class behooves you strongly like donald cerrone Obviously, put together a great run at welterweight. He's a career lightweight. Same with George Masvidal uh, at welterweight, and just like, I because because lightweight and featherweight are the best talent divisions. So the further you get away from that, that you can credibly compete, the better you're going to be because your talent will show more. So like, even though Masvidal is formerly a lightweight, like Masvidal, I think Masvidal beats up or uh, beats up Michael Bisping, right? Am I crazy in that? Yeah. I think he beats up Michael Bisping too. I mean, it's not Jorge's first time in the rodeo fighting bigger men. I'm sure no, we all remember. Yeah. It's not, sure his name isn't Jorge, it's George. Get it right. We'll get to this later. He's George Masvidal. Does he refer to himself as George Masvidal? I don't know, but the video of him in the boatyard, they call him George, so he's George. Oh, yeah, true. Deal with it. <laughs> I was actually reading about that earlier today. When he got the call to fight Ray at Kimbo's Proje, I'm assuming everyone knows what we're talking about, but if not... Jorge Masvidal uh, first became famous when he fought Kimbo Slice's protege, Ray, in a street fight, bare knuckle, for $200. And when he got the call for that fight, he was sitting in a McDonald's. He just started, ordered burger, fries, shake. And uh, he got the call and he said, hey, you want to fight this guy who's 60 pounds heavier than you? You 19-year-old kid? And he was like, sure. He was 19, 160 pounds, and he fought a six foot two, over 200-pound Ray and clobbered him. Just it's it. in, it's in, the whole aesthetic of it is incredible. He's got an, an awesome hairstyle an going. Yeah, he's got an awesome afro. He's in like long ass jorts. Uh, <laughs> it's just great. And they call him George the whole time. So forever and always, he's George. He's George Masvidal to me. Um, but yeah, like I don't. I guess I pick. I would pick Bisping. I guess over Condit. Um, especially because Condit's likely retired. I'd pick Bisping over Maya. Um. I'm but, serious, by the way. I would pick Masvidal over Bisping. Uh, uh, yeah. Masvidal, um, did you see what he said about Bisping, by the way? I I didn't uh, read the particular thing. I know they've been uh -huh. beefing. Yeah, he says that... Uh, he tweeted that Bisping is salty I didn't go on his first his 14-person total audience podcast. Sorry, I'm not trying to help you get famous. LOL. Hashtag UK loves game bread. And he called him a coward and salty. He called him a salty coward. Um, one fighter not on this list. Since I want, I do want to finish up this Bisping uh, line. Uh, I think I would pick Nick Diaz, even though we haven't seen him fight and we don't even know what he like what he's doing with his life. Really, I would pick Nick Diaz to beat Michael Bisping. Am I crazy? I'd pick Nick Diaz to get off the couch and like fly straight to an octagon and just walk in, having not done any camp of any sort, and beat Bisping today. Exactly right. Thank you. Yeah. Because so, somebody had real beef with that. Like I, I, I tweeted. Like I said, I tweeted this, being like, I think there are like twelve people, including several welterweights and Nick Diaz, who would beat the shit out of Michael Bisping like tomorrow. And so a lot of people were like, oh, you're just a hater, like bro. And I was like, no, I really think these many people would beat him. And somebody was like, oh, Nick Diaz is. What, Nick has a uh, fall. I was like, dude, are you kidding? <laughs> To be fair, like one of the reasons, yeah, he's he's going to be in amazing shape. But one of the reasons that I'd pick Bisping here is because his athleticism is failing him little by little each and every fight. Like he's a half step slower than he was a year ago, and a year ago he was a half step slower than he was three years ago, and that's that'd be a problem. But a, a year ago or two years ago, I think I would have picked Bisping over Diaz. But right now. Unless Diaz has fallen off a cliff, which he hasn't, because of course he hasn't. He's Nick Diaz. He never will. He'll be 60 years old, still calling people bitches and slapping them, and he's never going to get knocked out no matter what. But uh, yeah, at this point, I, th I think I'd take Diaz. I I just would take Diaz because to me, like, and maybe this is overly simplistic, but like 
in my head, the way you beat Nick Diaz is not with a volume kickboxing attack. Like you have to, you can't play the Diaz game of like, hey, we're both going to punch each other a lot and see who wins. Like that's just how you lose to the Diaz. No, I won't say the Diaz brothers, but even though, because I do think like Nick and Nate are just fundamentally different fighters, but I think that that kind of does manifest itself similarly. And that like, yeah. if you play their games, you're going to lose. And I think that like, Bisping's entire style of fighting is not moving away and picking angles and getting in and out with shots. He's going to try and put volume on Nick Diaz and Nick's just going to walk him down and beat the shit out of him. <laughs> like, but I, I think that's exactly how Bisping would fight because I think he takes really good angles and he kicks well from the outside. Like he has a really good oblique kick now and a really good front leg push kick. He has a lot of tools to maintain distance. He's always been the kind of guy who like fighters like Diaz have historically troubled him. People who got in his face. But in recent years, like he's developed the ability to step into, the, or I should say, the, t the tendency to step into the pocket and actually be aggressive in exchanges rather than just letting opponents back him up and back him up and back him up until his back hits the fence. And like uh, a Bisping who's on the outside throwing body kicks, throwing low kicks, keeping uh, Diaz away from him and consistently landing strikes, I think that sort of Bisping can definitely win that fight. I think that would be actually a pretty tough fight for Nick Diaz to win if Bisping really wanted to get in his bicycle, and I think he would. See, I just I don't I don't envision him getting on his bike there that much. Um, that's been the fight I've wanted for like ever. I like two years ago I wrote about before Bisping somehow got his way to a title shot. I was like the fight to make with Bisping has always just been a Nick Diaz fight. Like that's just that fight seems perfect. The trash talk leading up to it, like they they would be pretty good. Uh, opposition to each other on the mic it like the fight would certainly have a ton of action in it it's a fucking nick diaz fight um so i uh i'm sad that we'll never get that fight because i i mean maybe maybe the ufc is just trying really to keep, let bisping keep the belt and his next defense will be against nick diaz <laughs> and i'll be back on board the uh ridiculous plan but uh yeah that's that's really my discussion on the middleweight division is that there are a lot of people that could beat the shit out of Michael Bisping and middleweights are now they're now getting angrier and angrier by the day that George St. Pierre is not going to fight until October at the earliest. Bisping just came out like yesterday and said he hurt his knee and has to get some type of like cleanup surgery and stuff. So it's a uh, middleweight's a clusterfuck. That's that's my final take on it. And I think I think now it's time to move on to to the big discussion, the the up we finally have fights again. We've been off for like three weeks from from real MMA. There have been some good boxing cards in the interim. Well, one good boxing card, and then Canelo beating the absolute shit out of uh, Chavez Jr. and then announcing that he finally will stop uh, being a Michael Bisping level coward and actually fight uh, Triple G this September. We're not going to get into that, uh, but we will get into UFC 211 uh, this Saturday in Dallas, Texas, because the UFC still doesn't understand the basic idea on how to locally promote fighters and that Steve Amiocic should only ever fight in Cleveland. But, you know, correct. whatever. We'll just put it in Dallas for no discernible fucking reason. Um, so, on that, let's uh, main event Steve Amiocic versus Junior Dos Santos. Co-main, Yoni on Jacek, Jessica Andrade. We already talked about that fight a lot. Uh... We can talk about the main if you want. I haven't. I don't have an opinion on it yet, other than that it's a a great fight. Um, but before we get to that, we've talked about both of these guys. Uh, we talked about one of them much more. Much more importantly, the third fight from the top, Demi and Maya versus George Masvidal. When we were speaking beforehand, you broke my heart, TNG. Um, I know that you are a felonious piece of shit. Correct, but. I didn't realize that you are also the world's biggest coward, uh, and you are not picking Damian Maya to defeat George Masvidal, and it hurts. Hurts my soul. Correct. I'm actually picking the the most embarrassing outcome possible, which is that uh, Maya comes out and gets taken down by Masvidal and uh, immediately submitted, and then retires from the sport. He'll hook. Heel hook? Is, my, is George going to heel hook him? Because I'm for no, that. I think uh, Masvidal passes through his guard like a uh, knife through butter, takes mount, <laughs> just sinks in the rear naked choke, just fucks his dumb ass up, just ends his world. 
Although I'm a oh, Masvidal okay. hype man. Like, I'm a real Masvidal hype man. I read an interview earlier today where he just, he was talking about his uh, black attire because he was wearing all black, and he described it as uh, for his premeditated murder, which is Masvidal to the core. He is murdered out. Uh, I I would like George Masvidal, uh, but for the fact that uh, Damian Maia got royally fucked by the UFC here, um, and I... I was I was one of I think I was maybe the only person on this particular hill. But before uh, Woodley got his title shot after you know two oh one when he immediately called out uh or uh, when Stephen Thompson immediately called out Woodley and everybody was like oh Woodley's ducking Thompson I was like I think Maya deserved the title shot ahead of Wonder Boy. Yep. I main I maintain that I still maintain that he deserves a title shot. I maintain that after they had a draw. That they should have just been like, you know what? Let's, why don't we give give Maya the shot? Wonder Boy, sit on ice. Let's let's keep this shit moving. Um, and he got fucked, especially because he accepted this fight with George, basically because he got told to. He was like, you have to fight again. We're not just going to promise you a title shot, even though Woodley Thompson two is about to happen in like two weeks. So he should be the guy fighting uh, Tyron Woodley next. And I'm pissed for him. And so, beyond any technical, I don't, I don't even have a technical breakdown. There's no like, oh, I know Masvidal uh, is susceptible to a knee tap, and Maya's good. It's nope. It's just justice demands that Damian Maya should win this fight, and so I know that he will lose, but I'm sticking with him. And you're a fucking coward for picking George. Yeah, pretty much. But I mean, Maya's what, like seventy years old now. He's he's getting up there. And he's kind of in the Yoel Romero situation where if he doesn't get a title fight right now, like in the next 24 hours, he, he's at risk of breaking a hip. So, uh, yeah, the, the thing about Masvidal is he's so well rounded. Like, he, people respect Masvidal as a technician, but I don't think they respect him enough as a technician. Like, me personally, I'd consider Masvidal to be one of the great technicians of his generation. The roundedness of his skill set, like, in every single area, he's he, beautifully is, technical. Is he more or less technical than Ronda Rousey? Uh, What's his head movement like? Well, I've never heard any stories about him dropping world championship boxers and sparring, but he did drop Ray. <laughs> Which is close <laughs> enough. <laughs> That's basically the same thing. <laughs> basically the same thing. So I'd say they're about equal in the boxing department. And uh, Rousey has some submission wins on her resume, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware. And Masvidal submitted Michael Chiesa that one time. So I guess they're about equal there. See, they're probably about the same. Maybe Ronda's a little better at the throwy takedowns, while uh, Masvidal might be a little better at the, the knee-tappy takedowns. Well, I'm glad we've got that cleared up. Uh, continue with waxing poetic on George. Uh, I think he's just one of the greatest technicians of his generation. Like, he he's so good at everything. It's f almost frustrating that he loses fights when he's so good at everything. The way he lost to Ayakinta was annoying. He, he won that fight, clearly. I was about to say, he didn't lose that fight, but okay. Yeah, but he took the foot off the gas. He, he could have done more. We both agree on that, right? Oh yeah, he. I mean, historically, he is. I don't. I forget who it was. It it, it might have been enemies of the show. Uh, Connor Connor Rebush and Patrick Wyman. Um, they were talking about. I don't quote me on that, but somebody that I actually, at least, listen to their opinions, even if I don't respect them, uh, said that it it feels like his style kind of developed from uh from that like boatyard fighting, where he was he never felt compelled to put you know put the uh, put the foot down on the gas because he was he's just winning and so he's content to just defend himself and and win the fight that way and that that yeah. played negatively against him and that's with judges. True, by the way. uh one of my best friends is really into mma and we sort of bonded a little bit over jorge masvidal there's a few fighters who we bonded over but jorge masvidal it's okay to admit them. you're talking about me i know I wouldn't call you a friend yet, never. But uh, you're my girlfriend's husband, so I, I have I have that amount of respect for you. But uh, this friend of mine, we talked a lot about the fact that when Masvidal gets hurt, like the worst thing you can ever do against Jorge Masvidal is hurt him. Because as we saw in the Chiesa fight and in the Rustam Habilov fight, 
as soon as you hurt Jorge Masvidal, he goes from this guy who's just in there, like he's just in there to cash a paycheck, he's in there to fight, he's in there to do his thing, nothing personal. But once you hurt him, his eyes light up and he's like a demon and he just looks at you like, you motherfucker. And from that point forward, he comes after you to try and fucking kill you every single time. What When Michael Chiesa hurt him, do you remember that fight? I think it was a, an overhand ride or something, but Chiesa... I vaguely recall the Chiesa fight. Yeah, Chiesa hurt him, and he ended up uh, submitting him with a DRC choke later on, which I think it's only the second submission win of his career, but the fact that he submitted Michael Chiesa in itself is kind of insane. It, but, dude, Michael Chiesa can, can grapple. I also would like to point out that you called it a DRC choke, just for the listeners, because, dude, you're so fucking not American. <laughs> What not isn't it called, like, I know they call it a, I didn't even realize the I called dares. it yeah. I didn't even realize I called it the DRC joke, <laughs> to be honest. I, I really didn't realize it until you said it. I was like, did I? But, uh, yeah. You did. It stuck out at me, because in America, that's either a darse or a dares. Yeah, I, I do a shitty job of passing for an American. I don't have a particularly thick Irish accent, but uh, nobody's ever going to confuse me for when the red, white, and blue wearing boys. Well, yeah, well, not everybody has freedom in their blood. I'm sorry about that for you. Yeah, that's true. We're one of those slave nations. We're all slaves over here. <laughs> um, But yes, you bonded over, over George's being a dope ass and yes. beating the shit out of Michael Chiesa. The way we affectionately, and I know this isn't going to sound like it, and I hope Jorge Masvidal never hears me say this, but we affectionately refer to him as a scumbag. We're like, Jorge Masvidal's a complete scumbag, man. Look at this guy. He's great. Because he's this kind of guy who you could imagine that before every single fight, he's just in a Buffalo Wild Wings or whatever shitty American chain restaurant, just guzzling in fucking fast food. And then he goes in, he's like, it's fine. Uh... I, I caught my way. He goes in, he fights someone, and he just beats the ever-living piss out of them nonchalantly. Goes home, eats some more wings. I mean, he just seems like that kind of guy, doesn't he? And there's something oh, yeah, really endearing about that. And the best part about it is that it's juxtaposed against the other side of him, which is this dedicated technician, this incredibly technical, where around the guy who's so sharp and crafty in every area. And that those contrasting images create this one incredibly entertaining person. I, I agree with all of that. Here's what I'll ask you, though. I'm going to put the screws to you. Uh, you just said, hey, you know, the worst thing you can do is hurt George Masvidal. Correct. Uh, guess what? Damian Maia doesn't hurt people. He's he's a gentle constrictor. So really, when I'm you think you about it, may, maybe the worst possible matchup for him. Who rocked Carlos Condit the worst in his entire career? Power puncher Damian Maia. I still don't believe that. I just refuse to believe it because I am an enormous Carlos Condit mark. Um, I I just think he was just saying it. I just think he just the said words. Is, the way he it. said it, he not only said it, he said it under the Condit. I mean, Condit said that understanding how serious that was. Like he said that Maya hurt him as if he knew that getting hurt by Damian Maya with a ground strike is a really, really bad sign. Like an yeah, atrocious sign. Robbie and Lawler took his soul. That. Yeah, they took each other's souls. They all just left it in the octagon. I'm not. I'm not willing to say Lawler's soul is gone yet. I think that it likely is, uh, because that fight is my favorite fight in, of all time. But that fifth round, Carlos kind of got the ever loving piss just beat out of him, and so yeah, I think I'm glad that he's retired if he is officially retired I, I hope so, because the thing about Condit is uh, I had a conversation with Phil McKenzie the great Phil McKenzie, amazing analyst on Twitter a while back Phil where, can be a friend uh, of the show, I like Phil Yeah, I wouldn't go that far he, he's an alright guy, but uh, I wouldn't call him a friend we'll call him an acquaintance of the show acquaintance of the show, Phil McKenzie we once had a conversation on Twitter where we talked about uh, he specifically mentioned that once Carlos Condit's chin goes he's just fucked and I completely oh, yeah. agree with that because he relies so much on his chin more than almost any other fighter once his chin goes he's just going to get knocked out all the time all the time he's, it's going to be way worse than Chuck Liddell way worse no, absolutely and for my like honestly for my money I think Carlos Condit had maybe the Top best chin ever. in the history of MMA. Like uh, I go on. I got I know Mark I think Mark Hunt is like the general consensus for that. No. And not without reason. Um like if you just I think that's sort of what people would say. Um there are a lot of people with great chance, but like 
Carlos Condit got obliterated a lot like a lot a lot and he never was really the worst for wear for it like yeah. I, in my opinion i think he had the best chin in my history remember the ellenberger fight he got dropped like a sack of shit in that fight yeah and that was when ellenberger like you know look when ellenberger really was guy. good he was one of the heaviest hitters like in the fucking welterweight division if he not the heaviest people yeah like he he made you like who do you make like he made somebody like throw up in the ring or in the cage. <laughs> he hit him so hard. Yeah. Um, one person that always comes to mind that I think a lot of people don't give credit to when we're talking about just iron chins, one of my top five, and I put him on the same rank as Carlos Condit is back in the day, Patrick Cote. Patrick Cote's chin was serious fucking shit, man. That guy, you could hit him in the head with a cinder block and he wouldn't go down. Patrick Cote back in the day had one hell of a chin. He did. He did. One and of the best ever. He did. And uh, I'll tell you what. Um, my guy, like my pick right now, John Lineker is, I don't understand it. He doesn't I feel pain. Don't, I, I do not, under, like, I know Lineker is this, like, mythical creature in the MMA Twitter bubble. Um, and, like, Grabaka Hitman will just fight till the death to defend him. I'm not, like, I like John Lineker fine. I'm not with that. But his chin is... I, I genuinely don't understand how he just does it. He knows so John Dotson, who is a fucking hitter. Like, it's unbelievable to me. And TJ Dillashaw. I'll, I'll explain it to you. Basically, how it works is that punches don't affect Lineker in any way. Uh, they, they score, and so you can beat him over time just by, like, landing punches because they score and you win the judges' cards. Like, maybe you hit him with some bombs. But from a physical perspective... It's like you're just tapping him with a pillow. Like, punches just don't affect him. You can't hurt him. You can't stop him. He's an unstoppable juggernaut. You can outpoint him, but realistically, the, the scoring criteria should be upgraded or updated so that Lineker's strikes count, and maybe opponents don't, or they count <laughs> for, like, a fifth of a strike or something like that. Because it doesn't yeah. seem reasonable that a man who feels no pain and cannot be stopped or wavered or knocked unconscious or in any way harmed an impervious, invincible super god. The strikes against him from a mere mortal should be weighed the same as his strikes against mere mortals. But I mean, what do I know? I'm just some jackass. Look, it's I'm I'm for it. Like the the new damage criterion. Maybe we have to readjust our values for Lineker because, like, yeah. dude, John Dotson went upside his head with flush head kicks. Like, head kicks that clearly hit him and hit him clean and, like, knocked him off balance and knocked him out of his cadence and step. And he didn't even blink. It's unbelievable. Lineker might have a better chin than Condit. I might I might go that far. When he fought Jorge Rivera, <laughs> Jorge, oh God, Rivera Jorge Rivera is Rivera's a, a thumper. Yeah, he's a real hard hitter for uh, Irv. Francisco Rivera is that his name? I think I might have gotten it. It is. It's it's Francisco Rivera. Which one's Jorge Rivera? Jorge Rivera is a middleweight. Okay, yeah, it's Francisco Rivera. Okay, so when he Jorge fought Rivera, Francisco, also a thumper. <laughs> also a thumper. Correct. <laughs> when he fought uh, Francisco Rivera, Francisco Rivera is a real hard hitter for bantamweight and a really gifted weight tie specialist. And he just stood in the pocket and swung at him. Lineker did. He just stood there, planted his feet, and threw hands. And he just decided he was going to keep throwing hands until someone fell down. And Rivera thought, okay, this guy's a 25er. I'm like seven foot taller than him. I weigh like a million pounds more than him. I'm just going to start swinging back. And after landing three or four flush shots, you could see a look of panic appear on Rivera's face, where on Lineker's face, all you could see is cold, stoic death, because he wasn't experiencing or feeling anything. He was just throwing bombs, and he wasn't feeling any of the return fire. And Rivera was realizing this, because nothing he was doing was dissuading Lineker's offense, or hurting him, or even really disrupting the rhythm of his punching. He was just... It was, it's like he was trying to fight against a, a hurricane. <laughs> Dude, I, uh, I remember... Uh, it wasn't it wasn't a Rivera fight, but it was I think it was a Lineker fight uh, even where I had this sort of cold realization about how awful being a, like there could be moments in being a fighter. Like I had the, uh, when I was little I'm by little. I mean, I was, I was a teenager. I used to have a recurring nightmare. It was the only recurring dream I've ever had. It was a nightmare where I am like I'm getting chased by somebody like a lion or something and I just can't run fast enough. 
and like I just and it was so I felt so helpless and it was just a sheer terror because like I was always a really fast kid. I ran a four four forty um back in the day before I got fat and out of shape. So like speed was always a thing to me, and then just to be like, oh, here's the thing that you like are good at, and fuck you. And I remember distinctly watching, I think it was Lineker, uh, it might have been the Lineker Dodson fight, where I was just watching Lineker just get the shit kicked out of him realistically, just taking big shots all the time and not giving a fuck and being like, wow, I can't, like, in my nightmares, it, I felt awful about it. I can't imagine in real life fighting a person in a cage and knowing that I can knock people out like that's what I do and punching them square in the face and not doing shit to them like that seems so awful to me <laughs> Just yeah so it's the worst uh, thing it seems about a, as bad a situation as you can run into as a fighter when you fight a guy who just isn't human when you're literally fighting a robot because nobody who hasn't fought John Lineker can really understand what it's like to fight John Lineker we can watch from the outside but He's not like other fighters. He just isn't. He's not built like them. He doesn't act like other fighters. He doesn't react like other fighters to being hurt. Because he doesn't get hurt. I should say to being hit. But it's it's almost inhuman. I've never seen him react to a shot in any way that would indicate... And he's taken massive shots from TJ Dillashaw, Dodson, all these guys. But I've never seen him react to a shot in any way which would suggest that he is a human capable of being hurt by human means. It's true. Um, we, we got way off track <laughs> talking about John Lineker's chin, which we somehow did. came from Carlos Condit, and I don't even know how we got there. Oh yeah, that's what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. What were we talking about originally? We were Maya? talking about Maya George, um, but, uh, we've spent enough talk about Maya George. I think you're a giant coward for, uh, for picking George to beat Demi and Maya. Um, I'm certain, Dial, baby. I'm certain that you are correct. Because this is MMA and we can't, there aren't, good things don't happen in the sport. Good, I'm usually good people correct. are not rewarded. <laughs> like I've swept the last two or three main cards in a row. I, I'm one of those picking geniuses. I don't like to promote it too much, but my editor told me a couple of weeks back, hey, you've gotten every single prediction right on the last two cards. And Did I you really? Said, yeah. And I just said, yeah, cool. But awesome. I should, I should, uh, I should play that up. I should play that up. You should. I'm not sure if that it. was for the last one or the two before that, but yeah, I got two in a row completely right. It was the one with uh, Moicano versus Stevens was one of them. Oh, yeah. How was that? That was 10... Oh... Fuck, I don't know. I don't care. We don't need... This is bad yeah. radio. We don't need to bog ourselves down in that. Let's continue with the 211 card. Do you hey, want to talk greatness, about the main event? My greatness is never bad radio. Any chance I get to promote how much of a genius I am, that's that's a good opportunity for the podcast. But uh, the main event, I, I've written about it so much. I wrote a detailed technical breakdown on it, the Stipe versus JDS fight. And... Um, I really watched a lot of tape for that one. I watched every single fight that they've had since multiple times and I watched their initial fight way too many times and tried to pick up on habits. And my big takeaway is that it's pretty much the best tactical battle you could possibly imagine at heavyweight. It was like a five round version of Hunt versus JDS, but even then a little more savvy than that. It was just an incredible fight. You're, you're never going to see, most likely, a battle that comes down to who has the deeper bag of tricks in the heavyweight division quite like that one. Because normally when people are consistently able to land their money punches, somebody falls down. But that one went 25 minutes. I'm not so sure if this one will go 25 minutes, but I hope it will at least be long enough that we get to see that tactical exchange again. I have no thoughts on the main event. <laughs> um, I mean, I have lots of thoughts. I think it's one of the best fights you could make at heavyweight. Um, and so I'm excited for that reason. I have no idea what the fuck's going to happen in general. Cause I think, Stipe. I mean, I, I would steep as would be my choice just in the dark. Um, but at the same time, like I think junior's game has developed. Uh, like he's added the layers that he probably should have had earlier in his career. He's much better at, uh, moving at not getting just back directly up in the fence that he works angles a little better, like his footwork's improved and stuff. Um, being like an outfighter, which I think kind of suits his particular uh, athletic gifts. But in general, 
my my rule of thumb in the heavyweight division uh, in particular, and sort of translates to the rest of fighting, but it's certainly the rule of thumb in the heavyweight division, is who's the tougher bastard. Um, and there's no no disrespect uh, to Junior Dos Santos, but like he's Cain Velasquez took his soul twice, and Overeem stretched him out. He's and, as tough as a human being can be after those yeah, two JDS fights. Yeah, exactly. That the but. Velasquez. Exactly. That that's the thing. Like he is the fact that he took the Cain Velasquez beatings and still Human. like was still fighting, was still defending takedowns in the fucking fifth round. Yeah. Like un unbelievable. But he there's couldn't a get him off his feet. No. No, he couldn't. Like he he I that was the thing that always amazed me. I was like, man, if he would ever learn to not get back directly into the fence, like because Kane still can't take him down. He's beat the shit out of him for 20 minutes and Junior is dead and he still can't get him down. Like, fuck. The but, second time, just to diverge a little bit, the yeah, second yeah, time yeah. that JDS fought Kane, the first time I was really big on Kane Velasquez and I had tons of money on Kane Velasquez and I was telling everyone that Kane Velasquez was going to win. Kane Velasquez <laughs> lost. So the second time I again was really big on Kane Velasquez. I put tons of money on Kane Velasquez. I thought it was great i thought he was going to win for sure in the rematch i thought the first time was bullshit i told everyone look just bet kane velasquez see what happens and kane won and while i was watching it i was really happy i was singing kane's walkout music da, 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 just kind of hyping myself up but for the third fight i actually got kind of emotional towards the end of the fight i really yeah, it's awful yeah i struggled to watch it like i i felt almost tears welling up in my eyes. I got very sad because the way that JDS is being mangled and manhandled and he he seems like such a lovely guy, doesn't he? Junior Dos Santos. Like, from every story I've ever heard, everything I've ever seen, he is just um oh, I guess to to explain. Um the my jiu-jitsu coach in Atlanta um is an American top team guy, uh, Juan Carnero. He is one of the coaches for JDS. He's with him in Dallas right now. Great um, BJJ player. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, he is he's an unbelievable jujitsu practitioner. Draculino is his nickname, right? No, something uh, like that. Uh Jucal. Jucal, okay. Jucal. Close enough. Um, yeah, sure. Same concept. Um, but yeah, so like uh I, I met him once at the gym and every every other story I've ever heard about him is he is just a wonderful human being. Um, and he's always, he always cracked me up. It was like, he goes from this terror. He, he turns it on a dime, like in the cage when he's fighting, he's like a terrifying human. And he just makes the quickest change from just obliterating some dude to being like, Hey, I won. I'm so happy. Woo. <laughs> like, it's not the sort of like, fuck you happy. It's just like a jubilant childlike wonderment happy. So yeah. I'm with you. I'm with one, you on that. JDS one more thing about JDS. Through. My favorite moment of JDS's career came in that Miocic fight. And it was the biggest moment of the fight. It was the the knockdown. I believe it was in the third round. He knocked Miocic down with a left hook. And the reason it's my favorite moment of his career is because when it happened, re-watching it recently, it only recently became my favorite moment of his career. I didn't even remember it until I was re-watching from my uh, tape study. But it's so out there to me that he even landed that left hook because it felt like the culmination of everything he had ever been trying to accomplish in his entire career had finally worked out it's like he tried it a billion times and then suddenly it just worked once and he was like yes because what happened is he got backed into the fence by Majocic and hands down he hands down backed into the fence as he always does and then as Majocic came in with a right hook he slipped it and came over the top with a left hook of his own which dropped him like a sack of shit like, he baited him into the fence and dropped him with a left hook instead of getting pulverized as he always had when he ever tried anything remotely close to that. So it was a great moment of redemption. Uh, 50th time's the charm, and he got a great knockdown, and that pretty much turned the course of the fight. I, like you, I don't recall that almost at all because I have not done my tape study. So uh, that's on that's on tap for later this evening. But, uh, yeah, I don't really know what to do. You like it. I'm sure you like the moment because it's just hilarious. It's like JDS <laughs> doing the thing that has gotten JDS brutalized, but this time it's fine because it worked out. This time it was a fucking stroke of genius because he put Stipe on his ass, man. That's how I feel about like 
basically every capoeira kick that's ever been thrown in yeah. martial arts <laughs> is just this is idiotic why are you doing this and this somebody's time. gonna land it to ko and i'm like oh well that just reinforced a bad habit but cool <laughs> Yeah, like the Paige Van Zandt over Beck Rawlings thing, where Paige Van Zandt <laughs> threw several dozen of the worst <laughs> flying head kicks ever thrown, but eventually she landed one. And it was the there was another fight that was the exact same as that, which was uh, Sean Pearson versus Dong Hyun Kim. Do you remember that? Dong Hyun Kim kept throwing the same uh, crane kick over and over again. I think it was a crane kick. Oh, God. It was like a, a, a leaping front kick, I think. He just kept throwing the same kick over and over again against Sean Pearson. And eventually he rocked him with it. And same thing with Paige Van Zandt. Ball, well, it was pretty I much the same as the, the Paige Van Zandt thing, where Van Zandt threw like 30, 40 flying head kicks and then like finally switch landed one. Switch head kick? Come yeah. <laughs> and then somehow landed one. It was one of the most embarrassing fights I've ever seen. And I very rarely would ever describe a fight as embarrassing because, I mean, these are professional athletes. And they, they Who were the very, fuck are very you hard. kidding? I, come on, embarrassing is a bit much even for me. I try to have some respect for the fighters because I do really respect them. Like I don't, it's I don't I don't feel like fights. I'm editing this out. Them. I am <laughs> editing all of this out. You are just ruining the brand. I don't feel like fights are embarrassing very often. It's not very often that that's the feeling that comes up in my mind. But PVZ versus Beck Rawlings. That was an embarrassment, a legitimate embarrassment. She just kept throwing flying high kicks over and over again until Beck Rawlings walked into it, and then everybody was sad, except PVZ, who didn't realize that she had a reason to be sad because of her shitty performance. She thought it was great. She thought she'd done real good, but no. No, it's, you haven't. It's just great, because, like, it's like Rogan used to do this all the time and maybe he still does. I honestly don't know, but like somebody's getting their ass handed to them and the third round, they've clearly lost two rounds by just trying to do the same. Like, Oh, he's still, he's not trying to wrestle at all. And that seems like that's not a good choice, but maybe he knows something we don't like. No, nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, <Nope. laughs> just cause it works out. Doesn't make it a good decision. Um, yeah, but, I can't uh, think of any other reason that a fighter would make a terrible in-fight decision other than because he knows something we don't. It's Look, we, we aren't in camp. We don't know what they've been training. Maybe he saw that in the third round, that big overhand Chuck Liddell right hand is finally going to land. Maybe they ran like a statistical model and determined that with each flying head kick thrown, Beck Rawlings becomes more and more susceptible to flying head kicks. So at the start, he might only have a 2% chance of knocking her out with a flying head kick. But by your 98th flying head kick, if it goes up by 1% each time, you have a 100% chance of knocking her out with a flying head kick. Think about it. But not I... too hard. I was going to say, I'm pretty confident. I feel really confident, actually, that no fighter in the UFC is running statistical models other than like maybe Dominic Cruz might do some shit like that. Because but... he can't. I had a... PVC sure ain't, ain't doing that. I don't think Alpha Male's running stat models. Yeah, that's for She's sure. not with Alpha Male anymore though, but at the time I guess she was. Yeah, she's always Alpha Male for life. True. You never she leave it unless you're TK like Dillashaw. Of that camp. Yeah. You never, once you're in the family, you're never allowed to leave. As Uriah Faber basically put it. It's so true. Um, we're running low on time here, but uh, we've talked about the main event. We talked about the co-main earlier. Talked about uh, Maya, Masvidal. Uh, Cejudo Pettis is no longer a thing on the main card. Yeah, it's being replaced by the Jocko Branch fight. Um, I like... I like I like Chris Jocko a lot. I think Dave Branch deserves to be talked about, but we don't really need to talk about him because nobody honestly gives a shit. Uh, I like Dave Branch. Yeah, but like nobody gives a shit, you know. Yeah, that's I why like all Branch. I said was I like Dave Branch. <laughs> that's all we need. <laughs> um, uh, is there anything Dawson there? Career. There are two other fights that obviously stand out. Uh, I don't honestly particularly have much to say about Frankie Edgar Yair Rodriguez. I know that you have picked Frankie Edgar. I think that you're insane. Um, really? I I think Yaya Rodriguez is going to bust him up. I'm not even second guessing my pick. The only thing that would ever give me any reason to pause is the thought that Frankie Edgar is declining, which I've seen people bring up. If he's lost a step physically more so than in the past, then maybe. 
if he shows up severely deteriorated, then maybe. But otherwise, honestly, I don't think it's that competitive. I really don't. I firmly disagree. Um, I do think I think Frankie is very pretty obviously lost a step uh, physically, but I do think he has bridged that gap by just constantly making improvements to his game, which I respect the hell out of. Um, yeah. I think well, y- one more thing, by the way, when you said that there are two more fights uh, to talk about, I-, I was trying to think of the other one. I thought, okay, Parley versus Alvarez, and then Jessica Aguilar versus Casey. That's literally what I thought, and then he said Edgar. How is Aguilar Casey? How- how is Aguilar Casey? Look, there's if because there was another Jessica fight to talk Aguilar. about. <laughs> Jessica Aguilar is really good. I've never forgiven Jessica Aguilar for uh, inaccurately beating Megumi Fuji because that's bullshit. Yeah. Um, yeah, she that, didn't that, beat Megumi Fuji, and that can fuck all the way off. Megumi, as far as I'm concerned, Mega Mega Megumi Fuji retired, undefeated. undefeated. Yes. Absolutely glad we can agree because. We would have been fighting on that one. Who was Trust. the other one who robbed her? Was it Gurgel? Zoila, Frausto, yeah. Gurgel? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, the Gurgel fight might have been before the Aguilar fight, actually. Um, I I did a deep dive into Megumi Fuji like a year ago and rewatched like all the fights like four times. She 100% uh, beat uh, Frausto and uh, Aguilar the first time. The second time... There was it was like weird. There was like an eye poke that stopped the fight early, and Aguilar was probably winning. But who gives a shit? Um, but no, the other fight that I would have Frankie Aguilar Rodriguez is obviously that's like the marquee uh, fight. Just one more thing on uh, Megumi uh-huh. Fuji. Okay. If Yuana Jacek isn't the best female fighter of all time, then Megumi Fuji definitely still is. That's my opinion. I God, I hate to say this. I like you now. Um. I mean, because it's not mutual, Jed. I know, but m- my stance has always been that Megumi Fuji is like the best female fighter of all time, but with the caveat that like likely she will lose that title to Joanna or, uh, you know, somebody else coming along down the pipe. Um, and and for what it's worth, I believe Joanna and Jacek would beat the absolute shit out of Megumi Fuji if they fought. Right. But <laughs> but you know that's not how. That's not how you kind of compare eras yeah. or whatever. Especially because, like, I think Cain Velasquez would beat the ever-living shit out of Junior Dos Santos if they fought, because we saw it happen twice, but I think Junior Dos Santos' resume is a lot better than Cain Velasquez's. So in terms it of is. a historical standing, I rank Junior Dos Santos higher. One of my most controversial opinions, and that's fine. That's Yeah, that's that's an argument for another day. Um, I'm just going to jump in on the Frankie Aguirre Rodriguez thing. Um, I, Frankie can obviously win. Frankie's great. Um, he's, uh, by my estimation, one of the 10 best fighters ever. Um, I think Yair Rodriguez is younger, faster, longer. Uh, I, I know that it, you can't take a ton away from the BJ Penn fight. I thought he was moving better. Um, I thought he was, his footwork looked a little cleaner in that fight. I thought he's doing a better job of not getting corralled and maintaining distance for him to work his kicking game. Um, Frankie Edgar taking him down off kicks is something to be concerned about, and I do think Frankie is uh, a phenomenal top player. That he's he going to abs- yeah, your Rodriguez. Yeah, he's an absolutely brutal position player from on top with his strikes and stuff. But mostly, I just don't think Frankie's going to get him down, and I don't think he's going to be able to really land effective strikes. And I think Ayer is going to keep the distance and kick him a bunch. Um, I don't that's, understand. That's my take. I really don't understand why you feel that way, to be honest. I've seen other people see it, uh, say it too, so it's not just you, but even the betting odds are close. I don't get it. There's a very real possibility that I'll be proven wrong, but this is just one of those fights. Like It reminds me a bit of when, we- uh, when Weidman fought Mark Munoz, and Weidman was only like a minus 130 favorite, so basically That's a coin flip fight. Yeah, but at the time, it wasn't, because a lot of people pick Mark Munoz, but I put... A big, I'm not going to say what percentage of my bankroll I put in that fight, but it's the most I've ever put in a fight because I was really confident. And I'm betting pretty big on Frankie here too because, not that big, but pretty big because I don't think it's nearly as close as the odds are suggesting. He's going to get takedowns, I feel. I think this is like a 70-30 fight in favor of Frankie, honestly, if not if not more. This is a fight where it's really difficult for me. This is a guy, Yair Rodriguez, who he's gotten better, but not... He's not leaps and bounds better than the guy who barely beat Charles Rosa. 
than the guy who struggled with Alex Caceres. I mean, he just struggled with Alex Caceres not long ago. I think you're underestimating the fact that uh, Frankie took three rounds to beat BJ up and Yair did it in two. So, you know, just saying. MMA math kind of works. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, I mean, you can't well, we, be there, Ted. When you're right, you're right. <laughs> we will see. Uh, I To me, it just boils down to I think Frankie has to get takedowns to really win the fight, and I don't think he's going to do it. And I think that's sort of the... I think people that are on my side of the aisle think that it that's how they view it. It's like, well, Frankie... Why do you think he won't? I, I don't think he's going to be able to navigate that range and that speed difference. I think he's going to have to eat a lot of offense to come through that. And I think he's slowing down and I just, I don't think so. I could be wrong. Like I'm willing to admit that like there's a whole, Frankie Eggert has made a career of making me look like an asshole. So like, it's absolutely possibly. Does Remember the Cub Swanson fight? Oh, I, I'm pretty sure I picked Frankie to beat Cub Swanson, but yeah. Um, the Cub Swanson fight was one where I heard a similar thing that, uh, like everyone said, maybe Cobb can just stop Frankie's takedowns. Nope. 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 Took him down at will. Easy. No problem. Because that's just Frank Edgar. His chain wrestling is some of the best in the history of MMA. I consider him a better wrestler than, say, George St. Pierre even. Um, there's a lot of really established, high-quality wrestlers who I'd consider him to be better than technically. Uh, which it says volumes about Jose Aldo because Jose Aldo technically out wrestled Frank Edgar during both of their Even fights. He was the best fighter ever. Yeah, in terms of like technique, like he he is what Mighty Mouse is claimed to be. He Jose Aldo is the perfect technician pretty much. He's the closest to the perfect technician that we've ever seen in MMA. Not Mighty Mouse. Bullshit. Ronda Rousey. God damn it. Yeah, well male. We'll MMA. have to keep reminding you that male MMA. That goes oh. without saying. You know we okay. don't acknowledge females on this show. Okay. This is this is a purely sexist space. This is for the dude bros. This is a dude bro it's, podcast. You can't say we don't acknowledge females. We just talked about Jessica Aquilar fighting Megumi Fuji. Megumi Fuji's a girl? She is. She's the female uh, Sakuraba. That's who Megumi Fuji is. My god. I've been so misled this entire time. You have. Um. Alright, let's Let's talk about a couple other things. Well, Eddie Alvarez, Dustin Poirier, all I want to say about this, this fight's dope. <laughs> like, yeah, this fight's just awesome. Except that someone has to lose. I think that someone's going to be Eddie Alvarez. Am I wrong? Yep. Oh, you, you, you're picking Eddie <laughs> to beat Dustin? Yep. We have so I'm much not, dissension this week. I like it. I'm not hugely confident, but... <laughs> oh, I'm not confident at all. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. There's some picks on this card that, like... Eddie Alvarez versus Dustin Poirier has an asterisk next to it for me in that I'll pick Eddie Alvarez, but I don't really feel like I know. But when I pick Stipe Miocic over Junior Dos Santos, I'm confident in that. Like, I not necessarily that's me saying that it's 100% going to happen, but I feel like my read on the fight is well-researched and I'm comfortable that it's a solid read. And I'm comfortable that that's how the fight's going to go. And I feel like it's it's well-researched. But with Dustin Poirier versus Alvarez, I really don't know. It's just me kind of grasping at straws to make a pick. It's not, I can't really direct reasons because they both do so many things so well that trouble the other. Neither is particularly durable, for one. That's a problem. Like, both of them can be dropped and hurt relatively easily. And they're not and defensively minded. <laughs> And they're both power punchers. Dustin Poirier is one of the most underrated power punchers in the UFC. He's an enormous hitter. When he was a featherweight, he was an enormous hitter. And now a lightweight, he's he was one of the hardest hitting featherweights. And now he's one of the hardest hitting lightweights. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And uh, Eddie Alvarez hits hard in his own right. And they're both guys who can be dropped, who can be hurt. And in that kind of fight, how the fuck do you be confident in either man? Yeah, look, I'm I'm with you on that. Like my, that's why I like this card so much. Is I, I'm not confident. Honestly, almost any pick, uh, is one of those situations where my confidence is not. I don't know what's going to happen. So I have a pretty good idea how this fight will look, um, one way or the other. It's just I don't know which which one of those will happen as well. Because it's just yeah. like, like if Dustin Poirier wins, it's because Eddie Alvarez brawls in the pocket and Dustin Poirier is actually really good at like pocket work and he's a Reed. big hitter i think he's a pretty good interior fighter yeah um 
Which made um, the Conor McGregor thing even more amazing because he looks like he had nothing for Conor McGregor in punching yeah. range. Well, like, Conor McGregor's a sensational fighter. Yeah. One but of the best. To frame, I, j I just want to use that to frame how ridiculous Conor McGregor is just as a pure puncher because Dustin Poirier as a puncher is insanely gifted. Nobody wants to get in the pocket with Dustin Poirier, but Conor McGregor did and easily beat him up there. Easily. Took his best shots, avoided most of them, and just took his lunch money. But Eddie Alvarez, on the other hand, the thing about Eddie Alvarez in this fight is that Dustin Poirier is kind of foot slow and always has been kind of foot slow. Mm -hmm. And Eddie Alvarez is by no means foot slow. I think that angularly, in terms of the footwork, if he chooses to force the engagements onto terms that are favorable to him, let's say he cuts angles, attacks from angles, and then gets out. I think it's pretty likely that he wins to be honest. Like, he has the tools to fight in such a way that he can neutralize some of Dustin Poirier's strengths, and I think that there's very little that Dustin Poirier can do about it if he chooses to fight like that. And that alone is what makes me lean towards Alvarez here. The fact that I do see a clear path that he can take, which will give him a really good shot of victory that there isn't much Poirier can do about. I agree. I think your argument is sound. I don't think Eddie... I think Eddie might... have originally start out trying to do such but he'll just get drawn into a brawl and and in there i like poirier to land the the kill shot first i think he's got more power i don't i think eddie alvarez hits hard but i don't think he's really like an enormous power puncher per se um so like i just i think dustin's gonna get it done uh in that regard i also I won't lie, rewatching the Conor, like Dustin Poirier, clearly not Conor McGregor, we just established this, but Eddie Alvarez just had a left hand tethered to his fucking face the entire seven minutes that he was fighting Conor. Like, I, I don't know that he dodged or evaded or parried a single left hand shot, and Poirier has a pretty good straight left, so like, it's just... I Eddie can totally win. I can, Eddie got I can owned see. by McGregor. I don't think yeah. I've ever used the term owned to describe the results of a fight, but he got fucking owned, it, son. It nothing. Yeah. It, was, it was a defeat that is so bad that, like... It's the worst loss I think I've ever seen. I love Eddie Alvarez, and I wanted Conor McGregor to beat him. And after watching it, I just thought to myself, he had nothing. He had nothing at all for Conor McGregor. Not yeah, even a like, little bit. Eddie would need to go on like a ten fight win streak for me to think that like he has a credible shot to to fight Connor again. Like, nope, you just don't get to after that. Like that performance was so complete. Yeah, that invalidates you pretty much and your chances of ever fighting McGregor again. Eddie Alvarez is a fantastic fighter and I hated to see him go out like that and I hate that that's gonna leave a lasting impact on his legacy. But God, that sucks. To lose that way, so one sidedly, so he got smashed. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. Oh, also, the other thing I did want to say about the Alvarez Poirier fight is hot take. I'm coming in. I'm coming in hot because I've been defending this hot take for the last like two years. I know, I know, I know that Eddie Alvarez is a great fighter. I know it. I think people overrate Eddie Alvarez tremendously in the media, like in our little bubble. And I think they do it because he was such a great fighter for so long outside of the UFC that people that like the media people gravitated to him. Like, look, he's look at him. He's doing this. He's awesome. He's fighting the best people he can without actually being in the UFC. And he's putting this great. Like, I think he got. I think he gets overrated pretty heavily in that regard. And look, just straight up, his UFC run has been shit. He's had one good UFC performance. He put the absolute wood to Rafael dos Anjos. I'm not. I'm not saying he didn't. I'm saying he was losing that fight until the moment he wasn't, and then nah. he beat the shit out of him. That's awesome. No, nah, I, I I don't agree with that at all. I don't think he oh. was losing until he like he had a perfect game plan for dos Anjos. He is a better counter puncher. Like when it comes to pure pocket punching, he's better than dos Anjos, and he just he counter punched really really well. The way the way the finishing sequence came is because Dos Anjos uses his uh, lead right jab to yes. measure space a lot. All the time. And he stuck out that lazy right jab. And the second he did, the nanosecond that his elbow became untethered from his body, 
the counter was already in flight and he was just smashed. And to be honest, I think Eddie Alvarez is definitely a top 10 lightweight ever. There's very little doubt yes. in my mind about that. I think but that's fine. I think you're kind of underestimating his UFC run to a degree too. I think the Melendez fight is a big feather in his cap. He barely beat Melendez. And I think when I rewatched, I thought that Melendez won. The first time I watched it, I was pretty sure that Eddie had won. And so was everybody else. But after rewatching, I kind of felt like I was going against the grain a bit. And I thought Gilbert won. But That's either interesting. way. I was the exact opposite. I think when I watched it, I think I thought Melendez won. And I just rewatched it yesterday doing tape study. Uh, I watched it twice. And I, I think Eddie won the fight. It's mm-hmm. close. Close fight. Extremely close contest. But I think Eddie won. Yeah, very, very close. And Melendez had the most imposing shots of the fight, I guess, is what swayed me. Mm-hmm. But, uh, um, but he's I mean, a top 10 I, lightweight ever. Look, I, I agree. I'm not saying that he's not that. I'm just saying that I don't know what I'm saying except for the fact that like he barely beat Gilbert Melendez. Gilbert Melendez is a great fighter. Absolutely. No questions asked. Uh, he, I think he decisively lost Donald Cerrone. I think he lost Anthony Pettis in a close fight where he did nothing other than grab Pettis's hips a lot. Um, and then he had a great performance against RDA, and then he got completely McGregor. Like he, all, frankly, he got emasculated by Conor McGregor, like just straight up. Yeah, so, he got owned. He got sunned. So his dad his, came in and beat him up. Of his four performances in the UFC. I personally think he is one in four or one in three uh, or two and two, I guess, though there is a credible argument for him to be one in three. Uh, and that plays plays a role. And all and the final thing that really pushes it over the edge for me, I know Dustin Poirier just got uh, lit up not that long ago by Michael Johnson, but I need to see Eddie Alvarez bounce back from getting both obliterated physically and like mentally like that. That's the type of loss that I can totally see him coming in. And he sounds great. All his interviews, he sounds rejuvenated and awesome. But I could see him just not being the same fighter after that type of performance. So all that made me pick Poirier. Yep. I mean, Um, it wouldn't be the first time McGregor fought someone and they were never the same afterwards. Yeah, remember Mendez? He he said after the Mendez fight that he broke Mendez's shin. And it didn't sound very... Like, it sounded like a McGregor thing. Just another thing McGregor says, you know, McGregor Mm -hmm. things. But then he fought Frankie Edgar, and suddenly you think, huh, all right then. Maybe he does just <laughs> mash people's sins. Perhaps he did. Um, looking at the rest of the card right now, the other fight I would have said, had I been inclined, wouldn't have been Aguilar, Courtney, Casey. Um, although that's a funnish scrap as far as we're concerned. Uh, it would have Chaz Skelly, Jason Knight, uh, Hick Diaz. I think that has potential to be a really fun scrambly fight. Um, not really like a lot of stakes involved there, but fight could be pretty fun. We talking rare stakes or like well done stakes? Talking, we're talking not Helwani stakes, like medium rare. I won't go all the way rare, but medium rare Helwani stakes or medium rare not Helwani stakes. I think that fight could be very fun if it's mostly scrambling. Um, but yeah, I don't really have anything else to talk about on this main on this uh, UFC 211. If there's anything else, do you want to wax poetic on Jessica Aguilar for a moment? Or nah, fuck that card, fuck that fight too. I was just trying to think of any relevant fights in my mind that uh, because I I couldn't remember Frankie versus Yair, so I thought to myself, two fights. What's the other one? Well, uh, I don't before... care about Jessica Aguilar at all. That's fair. Before we She's close good. it out today. She is. I mean, she at one point was the number one. I'm putting a lot of quotations in the air. Fly yeah, yeah. uh, straw weight in the world. So good for her. Um, we don't have a cut list because there's really nobody to cut this week uh, since there haven't been any events for the last little bit. Do you have friends and enemies of the show for us? I think I've thrown out my friends and enemies, but I will just I'll reiterate Ariel Hawani, sadly, enemy of the show. Friend of the show, uh, I don't know if I said one, but if I haven't said one, friend of oh, friend of the show is Justin Gaethje, friend of the show indeed. Um, I will also throw out uh, as enemy of the show uh, the UFC because though Sergio Pettis is off this card and he will be getting his show money, he will only be getting his show money if he makes weight on Friday morning, which huh? is yeah, he gets his show money if what? he makes weight on Friday morning. 
Is this a fucking joke? Nope. Real thing. Legi- legitimately reported so, by MMAfighting.com. Just, just to make sure I'm understanding here, the fight's off, but they want Sergio Pettis to continue to cut weight until Friday morning when he will weigh in at 125 pounds. And if he doesn't make it, even though there's no fight, he won't get his show money. I don't know if he won't. I, I asked this question uh, to MMA fighting colleagues. It's like, this is stupid. The way it the way it is reported is uh, he you know he'll get his show money. He has to make weight on Friday. If he doesn't make weight, I don't know if they fine him twenty percent of the purse like you know they historically do. I don't know what happens if he blows weight. But the fact that they are going to make him make weight for any reason at all is asinine and infuriating, and it's it insulting. makes him an enemy of the show. It is. It's absolutely. Yeah. Like, uh, I had a completely different enemy of the show. I was going to go and make Luke Thomas a, f- a, a record five-time enemy of the show. <laughs> I respect it. But, I mean, after hearing that, fuck the UFC. They're, they're entering, we're putting them officially in the Hall of Fame. They're going to be the only ever Hall of Fame enemy of the show. It's true. Like, it's, I remember I read that in uh, Helwani's article and was like, what? You fucking fuck? pieces of shit. Yeah, like that is it's so and there's it's not like there's another there is not another 125 fight on the card. Maybe if there's another fight on the card, hey, make weight, and if this guy misses, you can jump in. There's not. There's nobody else from the fight. There's not a 135 fight on the card. There is the 125, and then it's a bunch of 145 fights. Like there's no fucking reason for this. It's absolute bullshit. Yeah, the only way to describe it is that it's fucked. It's really fucked. Like that's just wrong. Fuck the UFC. So that's that's the end of the show. I My, think. Uh, the wait, wait, wait. Uh, oh. uh, don't get ahead of yourself. My friend of the show is going to be the one, the only, the greatest of all time, Michael Bisping. I don't think I've named him friend of the show before. Uh, you have not. Perfect. I can't even remember. I think I said Patrick twice, and uh, I can't remember anyone else. Did I say Cody Garbrandt? Or was that an enemy of the show? And then I switched it to Luke Thomas. It's, I can't it's remember. Hard, it's hard to know. But Michael Bisping is definitely a friend of the show. I'm naming him right now. He's one of my favorite fighters in the world. He's terrible. And he's your middleweight champion. And he's a friend of this show. It's it's sad, but true. He is he is all of those things. He yeah, is all a middleweight champion. And, <laughs> and more. Um... <laughs> All right, folks, we have been going for way too fucking long uh, <laughs> yep. because we got talking about fucking bullshit. The Carlos unstoppable Condit John Lineker. And yeah, uh, that really like the Carlos Condit Lineker thing took up a, a huge portion of this show. Um, so, yeah, that's it, folks. Uh, it was it was I won't say it was fun, but it was something. Uh, TNG, tell the people where they can find you uh, on the social medias and whatnot. Uh, you can find me on my podcast with Jed here, of course, the John Lineker Power Hour, which we uh, air once a week. And of course, you can find me at champions.co, uh, where I write about MMA, I guess. Uh, I don't really know anything about it, but I like to wing it. I read Wikipedia sometimes, and I can copy-paste the fighter names, which is nice, because then I can just kind of write stuff in that's very vague and applicable to probably any fighter. But you, you'll like it. It's good. I'm uh, I'm really skilled at bullshitting my way through things. I tweet a lot. You should follow me if you don't already, but I'd assume you do. And that's about it. Oh, I have a full breakdown of JDS versus Myocic, which you should read. And I put out picks and predictions for every single UFC card. So if you want to know who I'm picking, and I'm very, very good at it. I'm told I'm picking at over 100% right now. Something like 107%. I'm not quite sure how that works. I'm no mathematician, but uh, this is legit, folks. Uh, so uh, check out my picks and predictions posts for every single UFC card in the future. What about yourself, Jed? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jed K. Mishu. Frankly, you probably already know that. I write for MMAfighting.com every single day. It is uh, my. It has been a privilege and a pleasure to uh, be here with you, TNG, much as I hate you. And uh, I will see you next week. Uh, maybe, maybe we can do a post-fight show for 2.11. Uh, and try and get out a little more content for the viewers, so or yes, for sir. the listeners. So then we're not doing two-hour fucking shows like this one did, and speaking instead of, we can give them one-hour ones. We were speaking early about severely about, about getting more and more intoxicated as our podcasts go on. If you want to get intoxicated podcasts going, there's nothing like a post-fight show. 
because I don't know how many UFC cards in a row I can stay sober for. So eventually, Look, eventually you're going to catch me on a drunk night. I'm absolutely down for uh, the Naked Truth drunk post-fight editions oh, every 100%. week. Like, that's 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 just good branding. That's all I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, let's do it, man. <laughs> all Fuck right. It. Let's um, go on, man. Dope. We will talk and try and figure out. Maybe we'll do that <laughs> this week because um, it is a great card. So, uh, yeah, that's it, everybody. Thanks for listening. Sorry it's so fucking long. Um, if you stuck it out this far, you're a fucking hero. And uh, we love you for it, but we hate you because you're still a piece of shit.